I'm a sucker for sentimental things, random items that I've acquired over my lifetime that don't really serve a purpose or function, but remind me of something that I think is worth remembering. Today we're going to talk about a strange case where a sentimental object suddenly took on a functional interest to me. Strangely enough, the object in question was actually in the background of my first few YouTube videos. I'll bring up a clip from one of them and ask you to ignore the fact that I look a bit like a homeless version of Leonardo DiCaprio from Django Unchained and focus a bit more on the backdrop where there's some small metallic knickknacks on one of the shelves. Those knickknacks are a prized possession that I have taken with me over the years as I've moved across the country. And what they are is this right here. And what it is, is it is a set of micrometers that my grandfather owned. And I keep them on the shelf because I, I think they look kind of cool. But recently, there was a video on Tested, which is Adam Savage's YouTube channel. I've mentioned it probably a half dozen times on this channel before, where he talked a bit about micrometers. And for context, while I have owned this micrometer set and kept it on my shelf for probably 20 plus years, I have known very little about them, beyond the fact that they were built by Sterrett Company. The detail that actually really sparked my interest was when Adam was going over how to use it, he brought it up and showed it, and then showed that this little knob here actually ratchets. And he explained that the reason that it ratchets is so that when you are doing a measurement, rather than tightening down the measurement pincers as hard as you can, you tighten it until the ratchet starts clicking, and that guarantees that you have tightened it the same amount for all of your measurements, which is a measure for increasing precision. But the fact that this tool that had been sitting on my shelf had this fascinating feature, and I had never had the foggiest idea because I had never twisted that knob, sent me on a bit of a journey. I tumbled down the rabbit hole wanting to understand how this device that was apparently critical to my grandfather's work function functioned. And the best explanation of how to use it came from Lynn Benton Community College. I guess it's a community college up in Oregon, and they had a really great, incredibly like 90s website explaining how to read a micrometer. Because that was the first thing that I wanted to know how to do. I wanted to know how to take this tool and use it for its intended purpose, which is to measure things. But before we talk about measuring things, a bit of anatomy, and I may create some graphics to go with this too, but in the simplest case, you have the anvil, which is the on the receiving end here, the spindle, which is the moving part that kind of pinces whatever you are measuring, and then the frame that kind of holds those two at a precision distance. Those are like the semi-static elements. And the part that you read is the sleeve and thimble, where the thimble rotates around the sleeve, which is static. Oh, and we can't forget the crowd favorite, the ratchet knob. So armed with that understanding of anatomy, it was time to try to decipher the rather cryptic hieroglyphics that existed on the spindle of the micrometer. And thanks to Lynn Benton Community College's tutorial, it wasn't nearly as hard as I thought it was going to be. Basically, you have gradations on the spindle and more fine grain gradations on the thimble. And the analogy that the tutorial that I found used that helped me a great deal actually was to think of the spindle, which is that 
inner larger gradation segment as dollars and quarters, and then the thimble as pennies. So you're going to shrink the jaws down until they touch on both sides of the thing that you want to measure. And then at that point, you're going to read two numbers. The number that is the zero line on the spindle, that will be like a vertical hash, and it will be, say, like 1.25, a dollar twenty-five, for instance. And then you will look at the thimble to see the pennies, which might be, say, four. And then you add 1.25 and four, you end up with a dollar twenty-nine, which ends up being 0.129 inches. To put it a different way, the dollars become your tenths of an inch, and then the cents become your hundreds and thousandths of an inch. So to run through a few examples, and hopefully I'll have a visual aid to go with these, if the sleeve reads $3.75 or 3.75, and the thimble reads 6, which is 6 cents, you know that you have $3.81, which is essentially 0 0.381 inches. For another example, if the sleeve says 2.5 and the thimble says 5, then you know that the measurement is 0.255. And then last but not least, if the sleeve reads 1 and the thimble reads 7, then you know that you have a measurement of 0.107. And I'll link it below, but Lynn Benton has a surprisingly good interactive tutorial with like 20 questions where you can quiz yourself and see how you did. And this is not to brag, but I got 100 the first time around. So clearly their metaphor worked for me, and I learned how to read a micrometer, which in and of itself was a really rewarding experience. It's fun learning new skills, and this one in particular feels very rooted in precision and something kind of antiquated but very advanced for the technology that was available when it was originally designed. So hopefully you didn't just come here to find out how to read a micrometer, although if you did, you can stop watching now because there'll be no more tutorialization. But the second half of this video is about the sentimentality of this object. This, this micrometer, for whatever reason, held a very special place in my heart. There are only a few objects that end up on that shelf. There are other shelves throughout my apartment that are chock-a-block full of things that are sentimentally valuable to me to a lesser degree. But for whatever reason, this one in particular is very precious. And I think part of that comes from the fact that it is a really cool object. And I know that's subjective, but I think it is a really cool object. And as a kid, that coolness really captured my imagination. It's also cool because it's engraved by my grandfather. He carved his name into both the outer micrometer and the depth micrometer. And I can only imagine him working in machine shops and this being a very precious tool that he didn't want someone walking off with thinking that it was theirs, since I can only imagine that every machinist had their own set of micrometers that they used for whatever it was they were machining. But there was one other item in this case. Like, there's a few rulers and a few additional items for the depth micrometer. But then there was one other item, and I'll put up a bigger picture of it on the screen because I don't think I can get my camera to focus on it. But it is a metal wafer, and it says 530 seconds on it which leads me to believe that it's a calibration wafer, right? It was machined to be a very specific thickness, and you could check if your tool was well calibrated by measuring it. But it also has stamped on it USM Co., which stands for United Shoe Machinery Corporation, which I believe was the machine shop that my grandfather worked in. And that company kind of delving down the sentimental rabbit hole is a fascinating company 
when you start to look into it. It was born around the turn of the century by three large machining companies merging into one. And by 1947, it had already been found to have a monopoly on the production of machinery to make shoes. It was producing something like 85% of the machinery to make shoes in the U.S. And so in 1947, the Supreme Court actually found that they were a monopoly and then decided to do nothing about it. And they did nothing about it for 20 more years. For 20 more years, United Shoe Machinery Co. was dominant. It was absolutely killing it. And then in 1967, the Supreme Court once again found that it was a monopoly and at that point broke it up. The company in those intervening years was instrumental in making weaponry for both world wars, uh, continued to make a great deal of machinery for making shoes and presumably boots, and I have a much clearer picture now of my grandfather presumably working in those machine shops, walking the floors with this micrometer set, measuring things, cutting things, whatever it is that machinists do. And to me, that's a really fascinating connection. Going back to the company for a second, they have some very interesting greatest hits. In addition to building all of this machines of war and uh, machinery to make shoes, they also were responsible for the original hot glue gun, the pop top soda can, and the pop rivets that were used to manufacture the Concorde jet, all of which I find particularly random and kind of scintillating, though I believe all of those inventions were after my grandfather's tenure in their machine shops. After the Supreme Court broke the company up, it kind of failed to flourish and was eventually bought by a much smaller competitor that eventually merged into Black & Decker of all companies. So that kind of completed the story of United Shoe Machinery Co. But that company left behind a massive factory space called the Shoe Building in Beverly, Massachusetts. And it was a essentially abandoned factory space that I knew about when I was growing up. It was in the general vicinity. And strangely enough, my first job in high school, doing kind of like a internship type of thing, was in an office space in what is now called the Cumming Center, which was previously the shoe building. And so in a strange twist of fate, this micrometer wandered the halls of a building that I would eventually work in 40 to 50 years before I was ever born. And that to me is kind of mind bending. It's incredible to think about. And to now have come full circle and learned how to use this tool effectively, even though I probably won't use it in my day-to-day -day life, is somehow both functionally and sentimentally very meaningful to me. And I certainly want to thank Adam Savage for his video that piqued my interest in this curio that I had had on my shelf for the last 20 years. And so that's it for this one. I just thought it was a kind of interesting story that brought together sentimentality and functionality of an object of interest for me. So I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>